Good evening. Welcome to Vibin' with Ashley Live. I'm your host, Ashley Live. This is episode 223 of my show. Tonight's guest is singer-songwriter Keith Harrison. Keith began his career as a keyboardist and vocalist with Fazo and wrote the hit song, Riding High. He later joined Heatwave, showcasing his musical talents on the albums, Candles and Current. Keith's standout tenure with the Daz Band, both in the 80s and his return in 2020, solidified his reputation as a respected artist and songwriter. With credits on hits like Let It All Blow and Paranoid, his talents continue to leave a lasting mark on the music, the music industry. Keith is in the house and I'm so excited to chat with him. So let's bring him on in. Hi, Keith. Hey, Ashley. Keith, Ashley how are you? live. <laughs> Keith, I love that you're coming in to this interview with all that energy and good vibes. Yes, yes. I'm happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Of course. Blessed, I'm blessed. So I'm ready. Let's do it. So, how's your weekend going so far? Weekend's been great so far. I can't mm -hmm. complain. I had mm -hmm. a good, good dinner today. Yeah. <laughs> What is considered a good dinner to you, Keith? A full course meal. <laughs> <laughs> Usually it's snacks. Oh, so, so it's just snacking all day? <laughs> I better shut my mouth before I get in trouble. <laughs> okay. No, no worries. <laughs> no, it was it was a good meal today though. Yeah. No, it was balanced and healthy. Okay. Awesome. We're all about healthiness. You got it. You got to be healthy. Yes, I feel like yes. healthiness is one of those things that we all strive to be, right? With working yeah. out and mental health and all those other stuff. All of that. But you know. it, it, it's like it's an ongoing battle, right? Yes, it is very ongoing battle. Mental health is is really serious in our country. Mm -hmm. um, it's a shame we don't have enough uh, mental facilities that can house or, or care for the people who have mental health problems, but because mm -hmm. of the everyday life that we're living now, yeah. with all the corruption going on and things like that, mm -hmm. uh, in the schools, outside of the schools, uh, it's just wearing on people uh, mentally, you know, and it's taking them uh, to another level. Mm -hmm. Definitely, definitely. Very stressful, very stressful. Mm -hmm. It's stressful because on the news, in our personal lives, yes. whatever we're dealing with, it, there's yes. always, mental health issues that can arise yeah. from it. But you know, there's one thing. You can have all the problems in the world, mm -hmm. but music will never die. I love that. I love because that. Because we listen to music when we're happy. Yep. We listen to music when we're sad. Mm -hmm. We listen to music when we're angry. Yeah. And we definitely listen to music making love. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. There's, there's music for every emotion yeah, it is, that we know. feel. Yeah, and and it's very fulfilling for people. You know, music is one of my therapies. You yeah. know, if I didn't have my music, I I don't know what I would do. Mm -hmm. I, I already tried to stretch without it and saw the the funk that I fell into. You know, the stress and and uh, uh, feeling down and empty and you know, just missing being around that atmosphere. Even though I tried to keep it up, right. you know, uh, doing uh, production things and and uh, things around the city, but it just wasn't enough like it is on the big stage. Yeah, there's an energy that you feel when you write and you produce and you're singing and you're playing. Yes, That's yes. Even, even as a fan, when you're listening to your fellow peers, right? And you're like, oh, this is just a Sunday morning and I'm just going to put on some good grooves, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, other people's music is very therapeutic for me other than, you know, the music that I do or the Daz Band plays or mm -hmm. uh, that we do, you know. Uh, believe it or not, I like country and Western music. Awesome. Who are some of your favorite country artists? Well, I can't name them, but I, I know the songs when I hear them, you know, because they tell stories. Yeah. And you can really feel where they were coming from uh, in their songs. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. I think the storytelling in country music is is amazing. Like mm -hmm. they tell stories like no one else, right? Yeah, definitely so. Yeah. 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 So I want to talk about the, the earliest years of your life, like those formative years. Can you talk about some of the earliest moments in your life that ignited your passion for music? Um, I guess when I was a baby <laughs> in my mother's womb, because she said every time she would put music on, I would pat my foot. And yeah. she said, you would always almost tear a hole in my, my stomach. <laughs> I said, really? She said, yeah. So uh, at 10 years old is when I started uh, uh, beating on pots and pans and mm -hmm. going around singing. And uh, uh, my parents had bought me this little little organ that sit on your lap. It had push buttons on the left mm -hmm. and keys on the right. And I would, you know, pounce around on that. So uh, and when I got to the seventh grade, uh, they bought me an organ. And mm -hmm. This is when, you know, you were still believing in Santa Claus. <laughs> In seventh grade, that's a little that's a little old though. That's old. Yeah. I was upstairs in, in my room and I heard my father tell my brothers, don't break it, don't drop it. And I <laughs> peeped down the stairs and I saw him trying to struggle carrying his organ in the house. <laughs> so that, that was because so I had to fake it when I woke up. Wow, I got an organ. Santa Claus brought me an organ. Yeah. <laughs> So that was kind of cool. You know, and from that point on, you know, my oldest brother played drums. Mm -hmm. And so we would jam a lot. And, uh, our relatives, uncles, cousins would all come around and listen to us play. And once I got my first band, uh, if you want to call it, that was sixth grade. Mm -hmm. We called ourselves the Ants. Mm -hmm. You know, because we would listen to a lot of Beatle music then. So, you know, they had these these Beatle wigs that they sold. Mm -hmm. And they had a talent show, and we went and bought some beetle wigs and put them on mm -hmm. and called ourselves the ants. And we won with the song Shake It a Baby. Oh, you know, so uh, uh, Very cool. that was pretty cool. And then in the seventh mm -hmm. grade, I started a group called the Medallions, and we would play for fashion shows, and they would give us a six pack of Coke. <laughs> 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 you know, no money just for. Here, go have some refreshments, you know. Um, and then it, time went on and on, you know, playing sports, uh, doing farm work, and doing music. Mm -hmm. But at some point, my father turned around and didn't want me to play music. You know, wow. he, he was just, uh, he, wanted, he wanted his sons to be laborers like him. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, like I told him, I said, Dad, you know, God gave us each different gifts, mm -hmm. you know, to use. So uh, I don't want to be a laborer like you. Yeah. I want to play music, you know. She said, you're not going to play that music around this house. Mm -hmm. You're going to get a real job. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh, as as time went on, by the way, when, when I became, a, we discussed earlier, when I became a senior in high school, Mm -hmm. uh, I asked my mother, I said, I was 18, I said, Mom, is there anybody else in, in the family that plays piano? Uh, and she said, come here, boy. And she took me uh, into our playroom where we had a piano. And this hymn book always sat on top of the piano. Mm -hmm. And she opened that hymn book up and she started reading and playing. I started crying. I said, wow. I said, Mom, you could have been teaching me what you said. Your father never wanted me to reveal to you, wow. uh, the, you know, to be in music. So mm -hmm. he actually drove me to do music. Wow. So it was like a yeah. full, full circle moment. He went it from was a full telling circle you not moment. to do it. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Powerful. Uh, because when I was younger, you know, he bought me the instruments, mm -hmm. but I couldn't figure out why when I became a teenager, things started changing. Mm -hmm. I, I guess he he saw that I was serious about you know playing music, but mm -hmm. his thought that all music was uh, drugs and alcohol and bad things, you know. And I said, "Well, Dad, that's on the individual, you know." Right, of course. 
if they, you know, want to indulge in those things. And uh, so uh, when he told me I, I had to get a job and I wasn't going to be able to sit around the house, and it, it was like, you know, sit around the house. You know, I wasn't mm-hmm. going to sit around the house. So I listed into the Air Force. Mm-hmm. And I went um, to basic training and they shipped me right back home to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, which allowed me to hook back up with the band I was with at the time we were called phase three mm-hmm. and as time went on we got discovered by Clarence Satchel at Ohio Players and uh, we changed the name to phase O the, the O representing Ohio mm-hmm. and uh, the rest is history yeah so yes. let's talk about that time with phase O because that was your first band so what yes. happened- Effects of recording three albums and touring worldwide did you find most fulfilling? Oh man, it was just the excitement of it. Uh, Cause then, you know, all you wanted to do was play your music and entertain people. I've always wanted to entertain people, mm-hmm. you know, whether it's a little crowd, medium crowd or big crowd. Mm-hmm. Just when I get in front of people, you know, that, that light bulb turns on. I never thought about the business side of it uh, because he was also our manager. So, you know, we trusted him in the things that he was doing with the group. Mm-hmm. We were opening up for them, uh, you know, and they were really huge then with uh, uh, fire and skin tight. So as the opening act, we played on their equipment. Mm-hmm. So we didn't have to worry about any equipment and we would get our little 15 minutes of fame. Yeah. But it allowed us to travel all over the United States, colleges, coliseums, auditoriums, mm-hmm. you know, to 60 plus thousand crowd. Yeah. Know? And and we even started doing that before we even had our record out. Mm-hmm. So we were playing other people's music. People thought we were this group and that group, you know, and then finally we uh, recorded the Riding High album. Mm-hmm. And, um, uh, it shot to number nine out of the top 100. Amazing. Yeah, yeah. So we were able to kind of separate from the wild players and start doing our own tours then. We were on shows with uh, George Clinton, Parliament Funkadelic, the Barcase, Confunction, Atlantic Star, Midnight Star. Uh, it was just, you know, a bunch of R&B groups back in the, in the day yeah. uh, that we were able to get on shows with. Mm-hmm. So let's talk about touring, right? Mm-hmm. Touring all over the place. Like, how did it feel to to open up for all these groups and then them have, like, open up with you and the collaborations? Talk to me about that time with Vazo and what it meant to be on the road for the first time. Again, it, it felt great. The only thing I didn't like is that the Ohio players had a tour bus that they would travel on. We had to follow them in a van pulling the U-Haul. Oh, <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> but, you know, we were like family. So, yeah. you know, we would just be laughing and telling jokes in the van. And we had two road crew. They would, you know, switch up uh, back and forth driving the van for us. So we didn't have to worry about driving at any time. We had gutted it out and put a couch in there and, left the long bay. It was one of those nine passenger vans at the time. Yeah. Uh, uh, Ford product. <laughs> 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 but uh, eventually, you know, we got to get on the big bus. They had a double Dutch bus that was pretty cool. Mm-hmm. And uh, once uh, we started riding on that, it, you know, things had gotten better. But, you know, being an opening act, you kind of get the, the raw end of yeah. everything. You don't get a big dressing room. You get a closet. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, on your your itinerary for for your food, you get uh, uh, like some meat and bread and, and water and soda. You don't get the big stuff, the big spread. You know, of course, yeah. later in the years that came, but starting out, you know, you kind of started out pretty rough. But that's part of the business, you know. Mm-hmm. That's part of the business of being on the road and and uh, paying your dues to get to where you're trying to get to. Definitely. It made me think of paying your dues because it's not like all of a sudden, boom, you're famous. It's just the right. 
and the hard work that that you exactly put, it's yeah. like nobody sees all that they just no, they see don't. They what's don't. on the other end they don't understand you know you got to live with uh we have five in the band we have to live with five people with five different personalities right. uh, you got to double up in hotel rooms and one uh uh, may be all right with his personal hygiene and one may not, you yeah. know, and you have to deal with those things, the snoring. <laughs> 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 so, uh, it, it, you know, it's all part of go growing up through the business and, and getting into the business of uh, music, mm -hmm. but you got to love it to be able to do it. It's got, it's got to be in here. It's got to be in here. Yeah. It's got to be in your heart. You know, that, yeah, your mind, I think, yeah, your mind, body and soul has to be focused. Yeah, I think some people get into music because they want to be famous, and it's like, no, you have to love this. You have to, yeah, you have to love it. You have, and of to. course, now it's a lot different. You know, exactly. as, you yeah. know, the more people making more money, you got social media. I mean, it's everything so different now than when we were coming up through it. You right. know, we had to really scrap to to get to where we were trying to get to mm -hmm. so you talked about riding high huge yeah. huge song for you talk to mm -hmm. me about the inspiration behind it <laughs> <laughs> well i have to tell the truth because people always ask how did you come up with riding high mm -hmm. well i said what does it say yeah so i was high you know, I have to tell the truth. Uh, back then, I was smoking weed. You know, uh, uh, I was doing pills. Uh, if you, for people to know me now, they would never believe that. Yeah. But that was then. You know, it was the early, late seventies. Uh, and so one evening, I had drunk a six pack of beer, mm -hmm. and I popped a pill. And that groove came about. Ba boom, boom, boom. Ba boom, boom, boom. Yeah. Ba boom, boom. And it just, it just kept going through my head. And was three chords. So I started at seven in the evening mm -hmm. and played that same groove to five o'clock in the morning. And my wife would come in and say, "Honey, please, please <laughs> go to bed. I can't stand." I said, "I'm on to something. I'm on to something." <laughs> We've been playing the same thing. <laughs> so the next day when I got to band rehearsal, I talked to band, the group, uh, Roger Parker, uh, uh, who's passed away now, uh, rest in heaven. Uh, he put the beat, he put a beat to it. Uh, I taught the bass player the bass line and he added a little walk up. Dun, 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 boom, boom, boom. And the guitar player, Put it ding, 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 and that was it. So the groove was there. So we had a gig in the ATL. We're coming back from the ATL. I took first leg driving. Mm -hmm. So I popped a, a Black Beauty, which was speed to keep me up. Mm -hmm. And the road crew guy was riding shotgun. Everybody else was sleeping in the van. I said, oh, man, I got a vibe to write, riding high. I said, switch places with me. So I kept the original stationery that I wrote it on. All that would be in my book was getting to. And it kicked in. I said, I'm riding high or riding down the highway. Mm -hmm. I'm riding high. I can't feel my body. I'm riding high, and I look back at everybody, <coughs> and I said, want to take you on a trip with me, because I wanted them to feel how I felt. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. then I said, I'm riding high. There's a funk in the breezeway. Mm -hmm. What do you think that was, that line? What do I think it was? Yeah. What I want think? to say I want to say it, but I don't want to say it publicly <laughs> on the record. So you got, you got, well, I pooped. <laughs> <laughs> it was a poop. <laughs> well, so, so, 
I wrote let's, that down. Wait, 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 let's rewind this. Okay, because <laughs> that doesn't usually come up on this show, but was it like the wind or the wind of it or the was, wind of it? Right. Okay. Yes, that's different. That's different than that, I didn't want to say fart. But, no, you could say that. Okay, I farted. Honestly, I'm gonna be honest with you, poop is worse than fart because yes, you're right. I farted. <laughs> That's what happens, you know. And, and then I said, can't free my mind, can't free my mind. So uh, after that, we let it go. Yeah. Uh, then uh, a week later, we started working on the song again. And uh, Robert Neal Jr., who's deceased also, rest in heaven, he wrote the second verse. But the second verse was talking about TAC and all this stuff. And Satch said, the radio will never play that, you know, right. because initially the song is it, it, it's a talking about a drug high. So the second verse, uh, Bip wrote, "I want to make love to you, da 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 da," you know, about love and make them mm -hmm. you know, trying to flip it like a love high. But that groove is so it's it's like I I compare it to Snoop Dogg sipping on gin and juice. It's right. just one of them grooves, man. You just you know, you just ride with it. You know, right. Some people don't even pay attention to the lyrics. They like the hook, you know, right. Yeah. but they don't really pay attention to the lyric, you know. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's one of the, the things that I learned about making music is the, the co courses, which we call hooks sometimes, mm -hmm. are just strong points and a good uh, bottom, you know, with a good beat. Yeah. Because if you, you can go up to somebody right now and ask them, do you remember Janet Jackson's song, What Have You Done For Me Lately? Mm -hmm. And you ask them, how are you going? They'll say, what have you done for me lately? I said, how does the verse go? And they'll go, hmm. Yeah. I really don't know. Do you know, Ashley? I'm actually a huge Janet Jackson fan. Um, so I feel like I do, but I'm being put on the spot here. <laughs> I don't know if it's off my head, though. I but the thing is, I completely agree with that because there are yeah. so many songs I've heard over the years yeah. and I love them. I know the chorus, right? But I don't know the verses. And you're yeah. so right with that. I mean, sometimes there's certain songs that I know the whole song. Like the and, whole song. And, and when I got with the dad's band, uh, I know I'm jumping, but I have to jump to this. We had an opportunity to work with Diodato. Mm -hmm. And Diodato, he says, the song is like fishing. You have to throw the bait out and you have to hook them. Yeah. And the hook he was talking about was the chorus. Of course. You know? Yeah. So yeah. even hearing that from him made me feel good to know, you know, that maybe I was on the right. Because I, I, write, I write my hooks first before I think about the lyric. The groove, yeah. the hook, and then, you know, the rest. But that's where you collaborate with people to, you know, to yeah. uh, come up with uh, your, your verses and bridges and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love what you said about starting with the hook, right? Yeah. You can say, yeah. There's so many songs that you can think over the years that came out that you know the yeah. hook, but you don't know these verses. Right. If you listen to a lot of Sheik's music, all their songs start with the hook. Yeah. Freak out. The hook. You know, right? Uh, you know, all their songs start with the hook. Of course. Yeah, that's where you got to get people. You got to, got to hook them in. Yeah, and I think when it's catchy and it's fun, and mm -hmm. you can like see yourself singing it mm -hmm. in the groove, it's like it gets stuck in your head. Yeah. Like, like yeah. don't know, don't know what else they say in that song. <laughs> but but riding high was was from you know getting high, um, and. I picked, you know, I, I think I picked up drinking in that when I was in the military because I was in, in the military from 71 through 75. Mm -hmm. And I went to uh, Guam during the Cambodian bombing. And uh, military guys, they did a lot of drinking and a lot of getting high. Mm -hmm. and, uh, because, see, I, Ryan High wasn't recorded until 1978, you know. Mm -hmm. But... I knew it wasn't me. That's why it was easy for me to quit. You know, yeah. I was getting high to calling myself trying to fit in. Mm. You know, 
fit into something that wasn't me. And when I realized that, that was easy for me to stop doing it. The peer pressure of it all. Yeah, yeah. You, you know, as as artists, musicians, we run into a lot of peer pressure, yeah. whether it's, it's drugs, alcohol, or women. Mm-hmm. We run into that. And you have to be strong enough mentally to step past it, or either you're going to get sucked into it and you're going to stay with it, yeah. Or you're just going to leave it alone and try to focus on something else, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, like I said, my heart and my guardian angel has been my wife. Mm-hmm. And uh, she's been my, by my side for 50 plus years. Amazing. And uh, she's, been, she's been my backbone, you know. So uh, you got to have something to hold on to that can you know, direct you in the right direction if you're going down the wrong road, you know? So go ahead. I think there are so many things that you could get sucked into, right? That would Mm -hmm. be negative for you. But I love that you listen to yourself and you're like, this isn't me. Like, I'm just doing it because everyone else is. Right. Because everybody thinks, you know, uh, music is all fun and and partying. But it's not, it's hard work. Mm-hmm. You know, from mental standpoint, from a creative standpoint, to a collective standpoint of of, of playing with with your fellow musicians, you know, things of that nature. So, uh, you have to be able to uh, physically be able to, not just mentally, but physically be able to uh, withstand those pressures that mm-hmm. come about, because. After every gig, you know, there's some kind of party being thrown for the band or they want you to come to this club and do uh, a showing. Uh, back then, you know, was, you, you would do promotional tours and you would just go out for six months to different record stores, signing autographs, doing radio spots. When we're in town, hi, we're the uh, so-and-so band. When we're in town, we listen to 99 point, you know, yeah. You did all those, but you don't have to do that stuff now, you know, because of social media. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but I missed that. Yeah. I missed that part of the the music industry, going, doing those promotional tours. That was so much fun. Mm-hmm. You know, it was so much fun. And you met so many people. You got to know the uh, radio personnel, people who playing your records. Mm-hmm. You know? You got to know them personally. Yeah. And I think with radio being the dying breed that it is. Right. right? Like most people don't even listen to radio anymore. It's right. you can just get everything on Spotify or Apple yeah. Music. Pandora. Yeah. So, right. Like artists who are always like, I've always wanted to get on this station because this is the station I grew up listening to. Mm-hmm. You don't, You that's not your goal anymore. Your goal is, I just want to hit a thousand streams. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Right? Yeah. And, and, uh, you have internet radio. Exactly. Yeah, so you're right. Mm-hmm. So let's talk about transitioning from Phaso mm-hmm. to band, Heat Wave. Can you talk about your experiences adapting to a new band? Well, Phaso, you know, we were in our 10th year and uh, we started having some problems with uh, some of the uh, members in the band. Mm-hmm. And uh, I chose to step out of that. You know, the record company had had dropped us. Management was bad. We mm-hmm. dropped the management. Uh, we weren't getting any work. And so uh, I, bef- when I got with Faso. Keith Wilder, who was one of the Wilder brothers with Heat Wave, had a group called Hearthorn Express. Mm-hmm. And when his brother Johnny called him to join Heat Wave, he said, Keith, you ought to come and join the band. I said, no, nah, man, you know, I got my own group. You know, yeah. we're ready to do great things. Uh, so when I left Faisal within two weeks, I get a call from Keith Wilder. And he says, hey, we want you to hit with Heatway. That that door is still open. What do you think? So I said, okay. 
but before that, Johnny was in a real bad accident that paralyzed him from the neck down. Mm -hmm. So the group hadn't done a, a album in quite a while and it was time for him to do a record. So Rod Temperton flew into Dayton. Uh, we had a rehearsal hall here and he started teaching us uh, songs to play for the new album that they were going to record, which would have been Heat Wave Candles. And uh, that's where I learned a lot about, uh, I could always sing and harmonize with people, mm -hmm. but I, I learned a lot about vocalizing with a group of people because their whole group, even though Fazo, we all sung, but it was only like four vocals. With Heat Wave, you had six vocalists singing. And then when I got with the Daz band, it was like eight vocalists singing. Yeah. So Heat Wave, Rod taught me a lot of chordal structure, you know, mm -hmm. cluster cl chords, zebra chords. That's the, that was his terminology of certain type of chords, minors, majors. Mm -hmm. You know, when you play by ear, you're playing these chords, but it, if you never learn how to read a chart or anything, you don't know if it's a minor or a major or, or yeah. a fifth or a third. You know, you just go by what you learn from hearing. Mm -hmm. So uh, I learned a lot from him from from uh, vocal and stacking vocals. Heat wave, we used to dub vocals eight times. We had mm -hmm. six singers singing eight times. So if you if you look in your on your on your speakers, you you had a spread like this instead of left and right. Mm -hmm. Left and right, it was like this all yeah. across this the you know the stereo system. Mm -hmm. So I took all that in, you know, to add to part of how I started doing my recordings as well with backgrounds. I love singing background vocals. Yeah. I love harmonizing. Yeah. You know, I love it. And uh, so we over in. Uh, it was time to go on the road. You know, we learned these songs and. By the way, Johnny was turning down quite a few good ones. He turned down Rock With You. Wow. And we actually did the demo. Mm -hmm. I was like, and the band was like, man. He turned down uh, Give Me The Nights. Mm. Uh, it was a bunch that Rod had gave him, you know, uh, to other people. But he always made sure Heat Wave had first choice because mm -hmm. he came from that group. Yeah. I took... Uh, I just was added to to the group. Duke Groom, I mean Duke Calvin Duke, who used to play with the Fatback Band, took Rod Temperton's place mm -hmm. when Rod left, and they just added me to the band to have two keyboard players, you know, mm -hmm. uh, which was a blessing because uh, toured all over Europe with yeah. them. So we're in the studio now, we're moving fast forward, recording Heat Wave Current, which was the last album that they had did uh, and uh, with that core group. Um, and one thing that Johnny, would, he wouldn't let me write. And that's why I didn't sign a contract with them. I said, Johnny, I'm a writer. Yeah. I said, <laughs> I, I, I can't sign the contract because I want to be free to be able to walk when I want to walk. Mm -hmm. But and he says, I'm good with that, you know. So I get a call from Skip Martin. Mm -hmm. now, I met Skip when I was in Faso. Uh, the players were trying to, how players were trying to get recruit Skip into their band. Mm -hmm. I happened to be at their rehearsal hall and Skip came into town. And I think I, I met I met them when they were Kinsman dads too mm -hmm. in Akron, Ohio. We were on the show. And uh, uh, we already had a record out. And I don't think they had a record out yet. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I really met Skip when he came to Dayton. And we kind of hit it off. And he decided not to, to join Ohio Players. So I get a call from my wife over here. And she said, honey, there's a guy on the phone. His name is Skip Martin. Do you mm -hmm. know him? I said, yeah, I know Skip. So she put him on. He said, hey, man. <laughs> <laughs> This is Skip. <laughs> <laughs> I said, oh, what's going on, man? So 
He said, look here. The leader, Bobby Harris, is looking for another keyboard player. And I told him about you. And I said, we could get two for one because you sang and play. Yeah. He said, are you interested? I said, yeah. So rest is history. When I left England, you know, I hooked up with the Daz band. Yeah. And uh, went right in. They were they had just finished up the Keep It Live uh, LP and were starting in on uh, their second LP on the one. Mm -hmm. And um, I went right in the studio. I think they were shocked because I fitted in so well with the yeah. blending of the vocals and uh, the silliness because they were silly too. And, yeah. You know, it, it was just a, 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 a good vibe, you know. That I felt, and they had a great producer, uh, uh, Reggie Andrews, who's deceased also. Uh, Reggie was really cool. He made you feel comfortable. Uh, when we all recorded backgrounds, we were all in the same uh, uh, booth together, and we would be cutting up in there. I, I don't even know how we got some of them recordings done. <laughs> but when it was time to go to work, when that red button went on, boom, yeah. we was tight. It was tight, just like that. Those harmonies came together, you know. So uh, then they recognized, uh, Bobby recognized my writing skills. Mm -hmm. And uh, we started teaming up, uh, co-writing together on songs and stuff of that nature. So it, it was a good fit. Yeah. 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 So let's talk about that because Let It All Blow was a massive hit for the Daz Band in the UK. Can you talk about this song and also how you work and collab with Bobby Harris. Well, let it all blow. Um, I had bought a, a little Casio keyboard and I had bought a, uh, a drum machine. I don't remember the brand name. And I had a four track cassette recorder, which was Fostex or mm -hmm. Tascam, one of those two. And um, while we're, in in on the road, I would I would take that stuff with me. So I was in my room, and I started writing this drum beat. But I said, I'm gonna make it like an Indian beat. You know, it's like boom 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 boom. And then I put this funky bass line to boom 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 so I said, oh, man. And Steve Cox was my roommate. He said, man, that sounds really cool. And uh, so I wanted to for it to have like a, because I'm a huge Parliament Funkadelic fan. I love I love Bernie Warrell because he mixed funk with classical music. He had classical training. Mm -hmm. And those lines like in uh, P, uh, P Funk, da 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 Da, 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 da. Those are like kind of Beethoven uh, right. string lines, you know. Mm -hmm. So I I wanted the the, the bridge to sound, you know, very funkadelic like. Now, lyrically, when Bob said I got I got some lyrics, I could put to this. I wasn't feeling it at first, mm -hmm. you know. He's like heave ho, heave ho, let it all. Blow. I said, Bobby, what's let it all blow? <laughs> he said, you know, man, you know, you just let me go. <laughs> <laughs> so I trusted, I, I trusted him, you know, when we got to the bridge and let it all go down, 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 down. That that part was really sounded great with the harmonies and stuff. So uh that's how we collabed on on that particular song. But um we just, you know, we just found a click with each other. Um, he likes my my uh, musical writing, and he's always been good with lyrics. You know, uh, I've never uh, doubted uh, his his lyric writing. He's always been good with lyrics. So uh, we just have a good jail together like that. Yeah. And I love that you, the vibes and the energy and it just, it's so awesome when you're able to work together with someone. So yeah. And it just, it works because so many collabs don't work. Yeah. And, the, and the good thing about it is we, we both accept uh, uh, 
criticism mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to writing. You know, like when man, I you know, so man, tell me the truth. Tell me the truth. If, if you don't think it's happening, let me know. Yeah. You know, right. well, man, I think we should try this or that or uh, you know, constructive criticism. You know, uh, a lot of people can't accept that. You right. know, uh, and that's part of creating music that you have to get used to because everything is not going to, you know, sound right to somebody else. You know, something might sound good. It's, it's like I look at the Bible. If you took five pastors and read the same uh, scripture, mm -hmm. all five of them will have a different interpretation of it. Mm hmm you know, so it's like music, you know, uh, you hear it one way, you hear it another way. Now, Rod Temperton, his method was he had five sets of melodies and five sets of lyrics to every one song. Mm -hmm. So if you didn't like it this way, so well, listen to it this way. If you don't like it this way, listen to it that way. Mm -hmm. And that's, what, I was like, man, this dude's a workaholic. Yeah. Be able to do that. Yeah. You know, uh, when I work on a song, sometimes I can create a song in, in four hours. Sometimes it take eight hours. Sometimes it take a week. Just yeah. depends on the vibe or groove you're in uh, at the point in time. But man, when we was in the studio, uh, Bobby and I and some of the other guys, man, we was writing. I mean, it was like boom, 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 boom. We was mm -hmm. laying down. You know, <laughs> stuff was just just coming to us. Yeah. You know? Because, you know, you, you're excited when you go in the studio. Wow, we're here to make another record. Yeah. This is going to be the one. Uh -huh. <laughs> you, <know? laughs> you always hope that that's going to be the one, you know. Of course. And we still got a lot of writing in us. We, we're not done yet. People people think because, you know, uh, you're old or they want to say we're old, our minds aren't. Mm -hmm. you know, our bodies might, the shell might be getting old, but mm -hmm. our mind is still fresh. Because you know, I love for music. Yeah. Of course, you know, you have to you have to flow with the different sounds that people are using now. You know, I had to get uh savvy in technology, mm -hmm. you know, all the different drum machines and software and things of that nature. And you gotta keep up with it. Yeah. Because yeah. The industry is every six months if something comes out and then they change it. And yeah. You have to be up on that, you know. And of these course. young guys, they're born into digitality. Mm -hmm. We were born into an analog. Right. You know, we had to learn digital. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and you're right. All these softwares and social yeah. media, it, yeah. it makes it easier, but it also makes yeah. it easier because yeah. you've been in this business for so long and you're like, okay, but now I have to... I have to learn this and mm -hmm. it's, it's got to make you feel good. Cause you're like, Oh, well it, yeah. used to take me, it used to take me 20 minutes to do that back in the day, but now yeah. only five minutes. And then we got to realize too, uh, music is a God given talent. Right. You know, you're born into it. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, the, you know, the, the ones that, that last, I think, you know, because, you know, you can still create, he gave us the ability to create. Yeah, but um, yeah, the the dad's band we man we was we was recording albums back to back, yeah. and we were doing eighty city tours. Uh -huh. uh, I would come home. I was probably home for maybe uh, a week, and then back out on the road. Mm. My kids didn't. Even, my daughter didn't even know who I was. Oh my god! You know, because I was gone so much. Yeah. And she was young then, you know. So, um, and uh, we we were when we was on it. We had two tour buses. One the band was on, one the crew was on, and then we had a uh, uh, equipment truck. Mm -hmm. We had road manager. We had a monitor man. We had an engineer. We had uh, stage hands. I mean, we was rolling. Mm -hmm. We had a valet. We had <laughs> Outfits, you know. Yeah. Uh, well, you still have the outfits. <laughs> yeah, we still have the outfits. Gina's oh. done pretty. Gina's done a pretty good job. <laughs> still have the outfits. <laughs> done a pretty good job. You know, uh, putting us in, you know, the outfits to to to, to be dapper on stage. But you know, we was in suits and stuff. You know. Yeah. Uh, Capizios. <laughs> you know. 
<laughs> we've always been a band that stepped and danced, you know. Yeah. Uh, but uh, we in hard shoes now, and I know some of the brothers' feet feet are hurting after after the show. I know mine are, and I sit down now. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you guys are up there working that whole stage. So I know I know men's shoes are not really comfortable. And then you're just all Knees over. are starting to go out. <laughs> but, you know, we hanging in there. We're still doing it. We still, yeah. we still, we still put on a great show. Uh, but, yeah, back in the 80s, man, that's wow. Ooh, we music, you know, you was crossing roads with every almost every band from every corner of the United States, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. And people that's then people are looking for that kind of music again. That's exactly. what's good about it, you know. They want to see live bands playing live music and still sounding good, of course. I mean, look, look how long Frankie Beverly is last, mm-hmm. yeah, and, and without even recording the new record. Mm-hmm. You know, and yes, I hear he's on his farewell tour now, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, because of his health. But, um, yeah, you got to love it. You just got to you got to love it to do it. Yeah. Has to be in your soul. You have to love it, have passion for it. And, you know, you got to find something else that you love. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, let it all blow. That was a big, big hit uh, over in Europe. And uh, I I love just doing the you know the little uh, standout things we had on let 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 it all blow. <laughs> 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 and I don't know if you knew on riding high in the beginning where it goes ooh, 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 that real high yeah that's me singing that in the beginning yeah everybody thought it was a synthesizer I mean I can't hit it now but. <laughs> Uh, but you could you could hit it though. I could hit it. <laughs> My wife tells me all the time, honey, you can hit that note. I said, yeah, right. <laughs> Not <before. laughs> Take about 30 years off from me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. In 2019, you started writing a book. What motivated you to take on this project? Well, this is the book. Yay! Title Riding High. My Journey with Thazo Heatwave and the Dad's Band by Keith Harrison. Yeah. And then on the back of the book is where I got inducted into the Dayton Walk of Fame. Uh-huh. But, uh, you know, I like to print my pages out after I finish a chapter. Mm-hmm. And, and put it, that's why I've got the clamps on it right now. Right. Uh, but I uh, got through Thazo. Uh, that was three albums worth of stuff I had to talk about. And I'm talking about my journey. You know, I'm not throwing nobody under the bus or talking about talking about Keith Harris, my journey. Mm-hmm. You know, this is my experience, what I experienced from these groups. Uh, I'm just finishing up on Heat Wave. Uh, Heat Wave was, even though it was just two albums, but there was a lot that we did in Heat Wave, you know. Uh, and the dad's band, ooh, we. Ooh, that's probably going to be like 20 some chapters because <laughs> it's six to seven albums worth right. of, of music and, and tours and stuff that, that I'll be talking about. Mm-hmm. And, and then I'll be done. And I hope to do, well, not hope, I plan on doing a book tour. Yeah. You know, I want to call it a sing and sign. I love that. That's so cool. Yeah, we enjoy it. So I'll sing a song yeah. and then I'll do the signing. Yeah. I think yeah. that's awesome because I feel like most Got people. Got a rain to it, don't it? Sing and sign. Yeah. Because yeah. most people, when they have a book, they just do a book signing, but sing and sign. Like I'm, yeah. I'm digging that. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. And you have to have a date for New York. Oh, definitely so. I'm going to call you and have you hook it up. <laughs> <laughs> I will yeah. work my magic, Keith. <laughs> oh, excellent, excellent. Yeah, I'm looking forward to, to finishing the book because, again, uh, I'm loving that now more so 
don't get me wrong, then then my music, but this is another phase of mm -hmm. me. I have to finish it. I just have to finish this book. Yeah. You know, uh before I leave this earth anytime soon. So, <laughs> so mm -hmm. I gotta finish this book. And I think this book is really gonna do something. Yeah. You know. Uh there's even been movie talk. Amazing. So I I gotta keep that on the on the hush hush side for now. Yeah. Hey. Right, Bobby. I can't tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> so I I want to circle back on something that we started this conversation talking about. Yes. Mental health. Because yes. it's like me, people don't talk about it enough. So I love that you are open to talking about it yes. in a public forum. Can you talk about some of the obstacles that you faced along your journey and how you've overcome them or how you deal with difficult situations? Well, I've had a therapist that I could talk to. Mm -hmm. That's That's been, you know, a lot of people don't have that. And that's right. why it's difficult for them to get through their mental health uh, situations, but uh, I've had uh, VA therapists because I'm a vet, mm -hmm. and I've had outside therapists. Um, and you know, if people say, "Well, why don't you talk to your, your wife about it or your family member?" It's it's not this. you open up more with somebody from the outside than you would, but you don't want anybody in the family to be hurt. Or sometimes you don't want them to know that you're hurting like that, yeah. you know, mentally. Mm -hmm. But um, I had a faith-based therapist on the outside. I really liked her. She was really good. And she she had me, um, she gave me things to focus on when I would go to those dark places. Mm -hmm. Or uh, I used to, I didn't like to be idolized, you know. I mean, not <laughs> idolized, but sit idle. Uh, felt like the walls were closing in on me. You know, mm -hmm. I had to do something. And the more that happened, the more dangerous it came to me from a mental standpoint. Because mm -hmm. the mind just starts, you know, going everywhere. Uh, so she gave me things to work on with that, uh, as well as, you know, the medication. Uh, medication kind of mellows you out and takes you out of the anxiety and, and stress. Uh, and then I, the VA took me back in. Uh, so I have a medicine doctor as well as uh, a therapist. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so with me getting that kind of help has helped me through my struggles yeah. uh, with my mental health. But you got other people on that that don't have uh, access to these type of people mm -hmm. that can that can help them, you know, uh, and nobody knows that they're suffering, yeah, or struggling with some type of mental health. Mental health can be the simplest thing, and yeah. you don't even, you don't even know that you're having a struggle with mental health, you mm -hmm. know. But as as I've learned as I've gotten older, it's it had got harder to deal yeah. with stress. When I was younger, you know, you could just kind of like man man up and kind of man it off. But, you know, uh, it doesn't work that way because the mind, certain things in your mind are starting to deteriorate uh, as you get older. You know, mm -hmm. you get wiser, but uh, there's things, you know, it's hard to stay mental, mentally strong sometimes. But my biggest therapist is God mm -hmm. you know so yeah. uh, it, with him I wouldn't be nothing I wouldn't be able to do what I do I wouldn't be able to give what I give I wouldn't be able to just you know uh, be who I am yeah. as, as a person you know I always felt you know people who because I would always be laughing and giggling and all the time and, and yeah. uppity. When I didn't feel like doing that, people felt let down. Right. So I felt like I was a puppet on a string, you know. Mm -hmm. He's not laughing. You know, something's wrong. 
you know, something's wrong with him. Mm -hmm. But nobody would ever say, what can I do? Or what can I, you know, what's on your mind? What's bothering you today? I always felt I had to, to laugh to keep them, them going. You know, right. so I've just been that kind of guy uh, all my life, you know. Mm -hmm. I've, I've been like the go-to guy. Yeah, but that's a, such a hard burden for you. Cause, it is, yeah. Very hard burden. Yeah, sometimes, Very hard burden. Yeah, sometimes like, you're, you're just not feeling it today, and that's totally fine. But, like, everyone else is like, come on, Keith, what's up? And you're just like, it's a normal day. I'm just not, uh, just not where Man, I'm needed. Let me tell you, people don't know the pressures it is of being a leader. Right leader of a band, mm -hmm. leader of organization, leader of anything, the pressures that's on you. Mm -hmm. You know, you're trying to keep everybody happy. You know, and there's always something that you got to deal with and they don't understand what you go through, you know, and you just want, you know, when, when, when you come off the job, you just want to relax, you know, uh, Kind of, but you can't help it because you're thinking about the things that you have to do to keep everybody happy. That's, <laughs> yeah, that's a lot. That's a lot yeah. for one person to take on. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So a lot of people don't understand, you know, leadership. And leadership is something that uh, you're kind of born with, too. I mean, mm -hmm. you learn things as you go along, but uh, you're born into You know, I always taught my kids to be leaders, not followers. Yeah. And they've done a, a, a very good job of that. You know, mm -hmm. my oldest daughter has her own business now. Uh, she has a doctrine. She's uh, she's a therapist herself, too. Mm -hmm. So she's doing two jobs. And she teaches. So she okay. has her own uh, uh, staging and design. Designs by her. Her home designs, rather. Then she does. She has about four or five clients for therapy. And then she teaches in the morning uh, at a school. And then my other daughter, she's an a, a attorney for Ro, uh, Roche. Farm, Roche Pharmaceutical. She did work at Eli Lilly. These okay. are two of the biggest pharmaceutical uh, uh, businesses in the United States. Yeah. And uh, so, uh, and she's furthering her education. And she's also a baker. She has her own Bake bakery called Tasty Morsels. Cool. So, and they're married and they have children and they're managing how to deal with that, you know. Mm -hmm. So I'm very happy uh, that they did take that stance. But I always told them, be a leader, not a follower. Because mm -hmm. if you be a leader, you are able to withstand a lot of obstacles that come your way. It says it's not going to be easy, but at least you're leading the way to make yeah. others happy. Yeah. And that's so powerful. I think leadership is one of those things like yeah. you want to be a leader in everything you do, because if you're following right. everybody, you're just, you're going down the right. wrong path. Just do your own thing and what speaks to right. you. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard for some people to take direction. Of course. Yeah. Uh, yeah. When I first uh, uh, was working in the workforce, as an executive director, I had a lot of uh, hats I had to wear. I was the uh, executive director. I was the daily operations mm -hmm. management. I was uh, financial. I was, uh, uh, what's the other thing? I can't, it, it was just so many and I had a staff of 13, wow. uh, program director. I had a full-time secretary. The hardest part for me was delegating. Mm. And my board kept telling me, you got to learn to delegate. Mm -hmm. You can't do everything on your own. But the way you see it, if you do it, you know it's going to get done. Exactly. Well, then that person shouldn't be on your team. Right. Then you got to you gotta kick them out and say, you you're done. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so that was the hardest part for me, right. learning leadership. You know, mm -hmm. it's hard when, when somebody's not on the team. You got to look at the whole picture. Right. And you got to say, hey, I'm sorry, but I need somebody who can blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And I wish you, you know, whatever in your your future uh, endeavors. So uh, 
I, you know, uh, sometimes uh, mental health can be helpful too. Mm -hmm. I know that might sound strange, but it can be helpful in the fact that what I've learned, I go to a therapy group every Friday and it's a group of us and everybody looks forward to me coming. Oh, that's so sweet. And I'm like, and and the director says, they look forward to you coming because you lift them up. Oh, that's wonderful. And you don't realize it, you know. So yeah. sometimes it can be helpful because you can help other people. Right. You know, yeah. uh, even though they're helping you, but you're listening to, I didn't used to like being groups because I didn't want nobody to know. Person. That was crazy. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, after doing it, you're hearing all these other people and you're saying to yourself, wow, they're worse off than me. Right. And then you find yourself, well, look, here's what I think you should do. <laughs> <laughs> then they look at you, well, why are you here? Nothing must not be right. <laughs> I love that they look forward to having yeah. you. Yeah. So amazing. Yeah. I mean, they, they, they lit up their eyes. Yeah. And, Wow. And it might make you feel good because it makes me I, feel great. Like you're making an impact on these people and like, you know what I mean? And I think it's just like, right. You said sometimes the grass is not greener on the other yeah. side. You yeah. don't want another person's problems. That, right. That's the right. most ball game. Right. Yeah. And and when I came off the road uh, from the jazz band and I think it was 92, it's cause I was, I was burnt out, yeah. you know, I was burnt out. I uh, wanted to spend time with my second daughter because uh, I wasn't around a lot for my first daughter. They're 10 years apart. Mm -hmm. uh, and I saved up a pretty good penny of money, you know. I took what I was making, put myself on a salary of $1,500 a week after taxes. Mm -hmm. And I was able to do that for about five years. But, wow. you know, I was I was careless, you know. I hooked up with another guy. His name is Sanford Whitlow. We have a little uh, production company mm -hmm. called uh, Jail Man Productions. And uh, he's another person uh, that I co-write with. Very good co-writer. We've, we've done a lot of music together as well. And um, I, uh, I just, you know, was burnt out. So we started saying, all right, who's going to buy breakfast? I got it. Who's going to buy lunch? I got it. Who's going to yeah. buy dinner? You know, we're in the studio and we record. We do a, We make a video. For, I think it was like five grand or something like that <laughs> called Power in the Groove. And, and next thing I know, my wife said, honey, the rent is due. I said, well, write a check. <laughs> and she said, ain't no more money. I said, what do you mean ain't no more money? She was wow. working too. You know? <laughs> and I wasn't ready to go back out on the road. So I said, yeah. wow, I got to get a job. You know, and I thought about what my father said. What came to my mind was a real job. <laughs> 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 so, so when I went to unemployment, all I had on my resume was all my musical. I didn't put anything about my schooling or anything. Yeah. I put, put all my music <laughs> and the lady at the unemployment said, Mr. Harrison, I'm sorry, but we don't see music as a real job. <gasps> I said, what? Wow. It was like in slow motion. They said, security. <laughs> 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 they had to throw me out of there. So, you know, back then when you went around unemployment, you had to have a little book and you had to write down every place you went to you know, and turn it in. Now they let you go online or whatever. Yeah. Uh, but uh, my my first job was parking attendant. Oh, wow. Can you believe that? A uh, parking attendant. Wow. $2.50 an hour. I had to be there at 5.45 in the morning. Oh, that's early. Down ramps. I said, you want me to sweep dirt on top of dirt? <laughs> oh. So my wife said, honey, we still need more money. Yeah. So I had to get a second job, which was Toys R Us. Oh, that's fun. The little kangaroo. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm in the back on the dock. 
I never saw so many bikes come in on a truck in my life. So yeah. I was putting bikes together, taking them out on the floor. So people were coming up to me as I was taking them out on the floor, asking me questions about the bike. So, of mm. course, I knew because I put them together <laughs> and they were buying them. So the manager was watching me. He said, you know what? I'm going to put you out on the floor. I said, no, please don't, because I didn't want nobody to see me. He mm -hmm. said, you're a people person. I saw you sell five bikes and one out. Yeah. So he put me on the floor. I think I was on Nutrisystem at the time. I lost a lot of weight. Mm -hmm. People were seeing it. And they was, Keith Harrison? Mm -hmm. Dance man? <laughs> Y'all Grammy Award winning man? <laughs> I said, look, man. He said, are you on crack? Because you sure look skinny. Oh, wow. <laughs> Said, boy, oh my gosh. But God was making me see something at that time. Yeah. And and I had a friend of mine, he says, Keith, are you back in church? Mm -hmm. I said, not right now. He said, you should get back in church and start singing in the choir. And that'll give you some kind of closeness back to music. Right. But this time, uh, when I went back to church, I started listening to the word. Mm -hmm. And as I listened to the word, that helped me too with my mentalness and get me through uh, those trying times. And doors just kept opening and opening to I got hired as an executive director. Mm -hmm. I started rubbing elbows with corporate people. I, I was like a sponge soaking up knowledge on business and stuff like that. Yeah. And uh, again, you know, I, I was, I had two, four hundred some thousand dollar contracts and a bunch of, uh, of uh, uh, other uh, funds coming in from foundations and stuff because I was running a nonprofit. Mm -hmm. I did that for twelve years, but the one the one blessing was that when I left the Daz Man, Bobby had always left the door open for me. Yeah. He said, "Whenever you're ready to come back, that door be open for you." Mm -hmm. You know, so I got back in twenty twenty. Yeah. So talk to me about that, right? Because 2020 was a year. So yeah. talk yeah. to me about coming back to the dance band. Oh, it felt good. It yeah. felt, my wife knew, she said, honey, because I, I, you know, I, and I was battling some health problems then too mm -hmm. uh, that I had to get through. And I wanted to make sure physically I could do it and uh, mentally. Okay. And, um, uh, she said, honey, I know you want to get back out on the road. She said, you haven't been happy for 10 years. Uh, yeah. She said, I can see it. And she said, and I done felt it too, you know, because you go through moody changes and stuff like that. So uh, I, uh, I called him up. I think I called him up and uh, I said, I'm ready. He said, okay. And again, the rest is history. <laughs> and here we are. Here we are. Here we are. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Here we I are. love I love that you came back to music because that is your true passion. Well, see, I never left music. I just, no, I know I, you didn't, but you had to, you were right. doing other things. And you're just right. Like, I was doing other things. I was yeah. still trying to do studio work while yeah. I was doing those other things, you know. Right. Uh, as I would come off work, I would, I would cool down for two hours and then go into the studio. Right. You know, uh, but it wasn't like being with the band on the road, of you course. know, or yeah. being with with a group of guys, talented guys yeah. uh, that all have uh, something different to bring, you mm -hmm. know, to the table. And they're all they're all great at what they do. I mean, I've I've been blessed to have been able to have played with some of the biggest and best uh, artists in the world, you yeah. know. I'd even uh, went out on the road with Morris Day in the time. Mm -hmm. uh, I went out on the road with a group called Low Key. I went out on the road with Ohio Players. Uh, just that uh, that being out there and, and being around all these uh, talented people and, and, and seeing what they do and how they do things. It, it has brought me full circle in yeah. understanding the business even more. Of course. Yeah. So yeah. it's it's always a learning lesson. 
Mm. It, always, it always is. Always, always. Well, Keith, that's all the time that we have for this evening. But before I let you go, do you have any final words for the room? Well, my final words would be stay healthy, mm -hmm. stay positive, yeah. and keep your head to the sky. I love it. I feel like I can't even say anything after that. Like, that's a mic drop moment. Yes, yes. <laughs> Keith, this was so much fun. Thank you so much for coming on my show. Thank you. Thank of you. Of course. I really enjoyed our conversation. I'm so excited to hear more about your book, and I can't wait for it to be released. <laughs> Me either. <laughs> well, Keith. Thank you so much. Ashley live. Uh, I am I am so on my phone on my on my show, Keith, and I love your energy. I'm taking all that energy with me. Guys, if you don't already, please make sure to follow Keith. See him on tour with the Daz Band. They're playing a bunch of shows out. Yes. Out for his new book. And if you're new here, I'm Ashley Live. This is Vibe with Ashley Live. Please hit the subscribe button and like this video. And Keith, thank you once again for joining my show. Thank so you. very grateful thank for your time. Have a wonderful evening. You too. Okay. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Right. Thank you, Keith.